Well, I think it's about six o'clock, so we probably should get going. And Chuck, if you want to do an introduction uh, about uh, the Energy and Environment Advisory Committee and the fact that they, you folks have kind of sponsored or at least helping to promote the presentation. Yes. Um, so my name is Chuck Willing, and I'm a member of the Concord Energy and Environment Advisory Committee. And, you know, as the name says, we advise uh, the city, particularly the city council, on issues relating to energy and environment. Um, I'm really glad to attend this talk tonight because um, energy efficiency has been one of our priorities. Uh, we have a goal of 100% renewable energy for the entire city of Concord. Uh, electricity by 2030 and uh, thermal and transportation by 2050. So that's a pretty ambitious goal, but kind of embedded into that goal is the idea that you know, we, we can best achieve the goal if we cut down on our energy use first. So um, energy efficiency is just a really important part of any energy strategy. Um, what I also wanted to mention separate from energy efficiency is that um, We've got a proposal in the works to the city of Concord to start a community power program. And what that means, what community power means is that the city would become the default electricity supplier for the entire city of Concord. Um, residents would be shifted from uh, Unitil default energy supply to Concord default energy supply. Um, the idea behind it is that we can save money by doing it. The, util the way utilities are made to purchase power, it's just extremely inefficient and it exposes ratepayers to natural gas price swings. And uh, we can do a program that doesn't need to do that quite as much. Um, but we also want to use the opportunity to do community power to increase the amount of renewable energy supply in the mix above what the utilities are able to provide. So we think it's a win-win-win. Um, our committee's working on the proposal that we expect to deliver to city council um, after the first month of 2024, and then it will be publicly debated. But um, you know, we, we appreciate any input at any point in the process that any of you have about that. So I think with that, I introduce Andy to tell us all about energy efficiency. Okay, That's great. Good. And thanks, Chuck. And uh, oh, they can go to the City of Concord website to yeah. look up what the committee yes. is doing. Yeah. I think we have a when, when do you think that would realistically start? I, um, know, I know it's got a lot, long way yeah, to go. There's, yeah, there's a process still to go. You know, hope, what we're hoping for is City Council approval maybe around March or April. And then we're going to need a few months to get to launch, assuming they approve. So I think it can't happen before July 1st. It might okay. happen sometime in the late summer or fall or fall or as well. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Chuck. And uh, if you haven't noticed already, there is Concord Community Television in the back. So um, I'm wired up with a mic. How do we want to do questions? If uh, I've, I've got a mic on this, so I can grab. Okay, uh, but if you don't want to be on Concord Community Television, then just, you know, <laughs> duck down or something like that. Uh, and it sounds like it might be broadcast in a couple of days. My name's Andy Duncan, and we're doing this button-up workshop about home energy efficiency. And uh, it's great. This is my hometown, and I haven't done a button-up in Concord in quite a while. I was up in Littleton and Wilton and Andover this fall. So great to, great to be here. And I uh, also want to introduce Ted Stiles, who's with Yankee Thermal Imaging. Um, Ted is uh, representing a contractor that does some of this work that um, New Hampshire Saves um, sponsors. And so if you're interested in any work done, do we have any other contractors or energy professionals here that want to say, introduce themselves? But uh, Ted will be available in the back. Joe? Yeah, Joe Cicerelli with the Department of Energy, New Hampshire Department of Energy. Yep. And uh, actually, Joe's a great person to talk with if you know anybody uh, who uh, wants to get involved with the Income Qualified Weatherization Assistance Program that we'll have a slide about where um, that sort of work is done at no cost to the occupants of, uh, of houses. So that's a little bit later on, uh, but uh, 
in terms of things that I'm going to be talking about. Kind of some kind of quick tips to begin with. And I have to kind of be somewhat sideways here so I can see the screen and see you folks at the same time. But uh, also we're going to get a little bit into insulation and air sealing, the ABCs there, and talking about kind of what to do if you've learned about your house has challenges, you know, how to, how to kind of get beyond those challenges. And today, I kind of feel like this was, it's a good day for a button up. It's pretty cold out there. So, you know, if your house is kind of like the heat goes off and it starts getting really cold real quick, maybe there's some things you, you might learn today. And uh, feel free to ask questions uh, as we go along. And if it's kind of a longer question, I know the library closes at eight, so we need to be out of here before then. But I'm certainly willing to stick around if you've got like, you know, here's my house and this is what the situation is, things like that. Ted's probably uh, willing to stick around too if you have any questions to contractors. And, and Joe, good person to talk with if you got any New Hampshire Department of Energy questions. So what's the greenest energy? Chuck, you want to? Um, energy you don't use. Oh, you're a ringer here. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if anybody's heard of uh, Amory Lovins and megawatts, you know, rather than megawatts, but it's the whole idea of that if we don't use as much energy, then we don't have to have as many power plants, transmission lines, all that sort of stuff. And so that's one of the reasons why this presentation is sponsored by New Hampshire SAIS, which is the four energy utilities. So here, Unitil uh, for electric and uh, Liberty for natural gas, um, and then also Eversource and New Hampshire Electric uh, Cooperative. And you might have a different supplier like Community Power or something like that, but those, particularly the electric utilities, they're the ones who are gonna still maintain the lines and everything else. They're called distribution utilities at this point. So, uh, megawatts is kind of what we're talking about tonight, and just to give you a rough idea of how typical households use energy, um, a big part of it is space heating. So you might use natural gas, might use oil. How many of you folks have natural gas for heating your home? So, a decent chunk. How about other fuels? What other fuels do you use? Electric. Electric for heating? Heat pumps? Okay. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. And oil. Yeah. Uh, the good news is about some of these programs, even though they're through the utilities, they're sponsored by the utilities, they, at least some of them are what's called fuel blind. So even if you have oil, you can still participate in them. But it's all the better if you have natural gas because that's another regulated utility, unlike oil and propane and all. And I'll talk a little bit about a few other fuels like wood. Uh, we're kind of a pretty expensive uh, state in terms of energy costs. Our electricity costs are quite a bit higher than the national average, and we have some pretty expensive fuels like oil. You know, on a BTU basis, you don't get as much heat out of a gallon of oil as you would uh, for the same, same price that you would pay for um, something like natural gas, much, much less expensive for the amount of BTUs in it. If you're interested in kind of what the average prices are for fuel prices, you can go to the New Hampshire Department of Energy and they've got a nice kind of up, updated pretty frequently fuel prices, the kind of average prices throughout the state. So if you're wondering, are you getting a decent, decent price for a gallon of oil or something like that, particularly delivered fuels. Uh, and in terms of other energy uses, uh, refrigerators are big enough to kind of have its, have its own little chunk of the pie there and hot water heating is a big one as well. Um, more and more air conditioning. And then there's lots of other uh, electrical uses and things like that, and we just put that under the, the other category. But a big part of what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is the, the space heating, a little bit on hot water heating, but also some tips about saving electricity and things like that as well. And so one of the things that I recommend people do do most of you folks have Unitil for your electric distribution utility? They do have like an online option. You can get more information if you access your account online. But even with just the paper bill, this is from Eversource, so it's gonna look a little bit different for Unitil, but they will have 
kind of a last 12 or 13 months consumption. And it's helpful looking at that saying, hmm, you know, how does this month compare to a year ago? And am I using more in the summer or the winter or some other time? Just kind of understanding your electric bill a bit more and just understanding that concept of a kilowatt hour, which is kind of like the name implies it's a thousand watts of electricity used over the course of an hour. So think like 10, 100 watt light bulbs on for an hour. That's a kilowatt hour. And uh, the good news with Unitil right now, compared to this time last year, is we're paying a lot less for our electricity. It's kind of gone up and down quite a bit. We're probably going to see a lot more variability, but it was, it was pretty dang high last year, and it's really kind of settled down quite a bit uh, this year. Uh, and who knows you know, what it's going to be in the future. So just a couple uh, areas to think about in terms of where you're using electricity and potential areas for uh, energy efficiency. Things like if you have electric water heater, if it's kind of the old style, <coughs> then there's some great opportunities with heat pump hot water heater. So a great opportunity for saving electricity that way. Refrigerators and freezers, same, same sort of concept. If it's an older one, the newer ENERGY STAR models, a lot more efficient, can save energy, and there's also some, some rebates you can get from New Hampshire Saves. So I'm not going to go through everything here. I've got a, some slides that mention a couple of these things. I will mention dehumidifiers because think of that dehumidifier, if you've got one in your basement, as like a little window air conditioner that, you know, it's using a lot of electricity. And so getting one that uses it more efficiently and just not having it turn on quite so much can actually save a lot of electricity. How many of you folks had, have dehumidifiers? So yeah, decent number. And hopefully, you know, at this point, hopefully your basement or wherever you, you have it set up doesn't need dehumidification because it's much drier air out there now. Um, and it's hopefully kind of thing where you just have it on during the summertime. I had one going in my garage this year and it was, it was so humid out all my stuff was starting to get moldy and everything. I'm like, that's an energy monitor, it kills it. Yeah. Dehumidifier going in the garage, but you know, 90% relative humidity almost every day. This is a big year, or was a big year for dehumidifiers because it was just such a wet and rainy uh, summer. Question about hot water heaters. Is the latest technology, the heat pump, uh, hot water heaters, you know, five years ago, it was the tankless. Yeah, they, you know, if, if somebody asks me, I think for pretty much any fuel, except for maybe natural gas, you know, what's the best hot water heater? Uh, I would pretty much say in almost all cases, it would be the heat pump hot water heater. But I will get to that a little bit further down the road when we talk about some of the incentives that are out there. That's another reason to be thinking about a heat pump hot water heater is that both New Hampshire saves and uh, tax credits, federal tax credits through the Inflation Reduction Act mean you can get quite a bit off the cost of a new heat pump hot water heater. Uh, I did confirm that the library here has, might not look exactly like this, but they have these things that you can check out that are these nice little uh, plug-in watt meters and they have a timer associated with them. So essentially means that uh, you can find out how much electricity in kilowatt hours that you're using for the amount of time that it's plugged in. You have to do a little bit of math to figure out what would be that equivalent for the course of a year. But that can come in real handy to kind of ask yourself, hmm, you know, is this refrigerator using a lot of electricity or not so much? Same thing for, for other stuff. I think it's real interesting uh, for things that we call uh, phantom loads or vampire loads. And um, it's uh, the concept that there's a lot of devices that we have in our homes that you might not be using that might essentially be off, but they're not all the way off. And some of those can be using actually quite a bit of electricity. Some of them use very little, and it really kind of varies all over the place. And it's kind of hard to control those, but at least if you had a plug-in watt meter, you can find out, is it using half a watt, or is it using eight watts, and you know, how much does that add up to over the course of a year, things like that. And that's for, there's devices that might be using 30 watts when you're not actively using them. Um, and so that can really add up if you have a number of things like that. Yeah, so this is just a plug-in meter, so it's only for devices that you can plug into it. 
So you basically just put this between the wall outlet and your plug. Um, but good that you asked that question because this is the next slide, which is you can get whole house electricity meters. And uh, I've got one with my house. I didn't get connected to Wi-Fi here, so not sure if, I, if it'll work, but uh, it's pretty neat. It basically shows me on a second by second basis how much electricity am I using? And then it is able to figure out, kind of using artificial intelligence, um, different devices and how much they're using. So I have a plug-in hybrid car, and it basically tells me how much electricity did it take to, to recharge that car at last go around. Which brand do you use? This is called a Sense. And so right now it's showing me that I'm using 373 watts. So, you know, if you basically said if, if I was still using that same amount of power over the next couple of hours, that would be basically a kilowatt hour. And it's showing that my refrigerator is on, my boiler circulator pump, which actually can use quite a bit of electricity, is on. And then there's some other things that are either always on, which might be those, those vampire loads, and then other things it hasn't quite figured out. But I did find out, for example, that uh, my, our electric kettle uses more electricity than our dishwasher, which is like, whoa. And it's just because it's very intensive use of electricity over not a real long period of time, but it uses a lot when it's on, whereas um, where dishwashers have gotten so efficient that they're actually not using that much. So yeah, kind of you find out interesting things like that. Costs a couple hundred bucks to, to install those. Probably makes sense to have an electrician do it unless you're real familiar with it, because you have to basically take the cover off the electric panel and put these little, it's not uh, unscrewing any things, but you put these little ammeter things on the, the main loads and then there's a Wi-Fi connection and things like that. Question? Are you satisfied with the sense? Okay, I've been looking at it for a long time. Yeah. You, know, you, you read the emails and some people say they don't work. Some people well, I mean, there, there's pretty much, there's a lot of different devices that will give you that second by second electrical consumption. And that alone, to me, is very interesting. And then the fact that it uses AI to kind of figure out different devices. It certainly hasn't figured out everything, but it's figured out a lot of the kind of major electric using devices. So I'd say, I mean, I'm an energy geek, so, you know, I'm kind of a little more interested in this maybe than most people, but I'd say I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with it. That's, it was a, a worthy, worthy investment, in my opinion. It can be real handy if you've got, you know, a big electric bill and there could be things that aren't plug-in devices. You know, like people who live in rural areas might not realize that they have oftentimes septic pumps that's pumping up that septic material to a septic field. You know, is that working properly? How much electricity is that using? Their water well pump, you know, things like that. Those aren't plug-in devices or, you know, their jacuzzi heater or things like that. A lot of those are 220 volts and you won't be able to determine how much electricity they use by something like this little plug-in device. So I always like to say that the people who are here are not the ones that really need, need to hear this message about shutting things off and not in use. It's more the people who you would like to come to this presentation who, who didn't come. But you know, just kind of practicing that sort of frugality. We're pretty good at it here in, in New Hampshire and New England, but just shutting things off when you know, lights in rooms and figuring out thermostats and things like that where um, as much as possible, it, it does make a difference overall. So I want to mention, uh, I would assume a lot of you folks already have a lot of LED lights. You know, we've been kind of in this LED lighting revolution for quite a while now. So it's actually kind of, we're kind of a little bit more on the tail end of it. Um, but just keep in mind that the LED lights are really very inexpensive now. So even if you've got something that's only on for half an hour a day or something like that, it still might make sense to, to change it out. And uh, great time to be thinking about holiday lights. If you've got some of the old incandescent holiday lights, the LED lights use something on the order of like 85% less electricity than the incandescent lights for the same amount of brightness. So I mean, you can even get little battery powered ones. They use so little electricity now. And outdoor lights and things like that, there's, there's certainly plenty of specialty lights that are available. There's even kind of the small candelabra 
uh, lights that you can get in LED now. So I encourage you to kind of see if there's any more opportunities other than what you've already done. Well, I bought a box of 24. They were on a very special sale. Uh -huh. So essentially, I get all the ones in the whole house, even the ones that you know, are in the closet I use maybe an hour a year. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, I found it didn't show up on the electric bill. Oh, I thought you were going to say, you know, next month's electric bill <laughs> made a big difference. So that's, that's interesting. Did, were you replacing the old kind of the squiggly compact fluorescent lights? Oh, or? Yeah, so that is surprising. Yeah, so that, that might be the reason why is that if it really was just an hour a year, then that's not going to show up a whole lot. But if it was something that was on for an hour a day or, you know, at least 30 minutes a day and you did a bunch of them, uh, I've at least talked with other people who said, yeah, I did a big replacement with LED lights and it did, did show up on their electric bills being quite a bit less, you know, the next month. So it's certainly something that uh, uses electricity isn't going to use any electricity if it's not on. So that's kind of the a big factor is just how, how um, often on are those lights. And yeah, if it's a closet that you rarely go into, maybe it doesn't make sense to, to do something like that. And, and the other thing is they have these exaggerated you know, things on how long they last. And then you read, you know, the last 100 years, you only use them an hour a year. But, you know, I find I'm burning those out. Yeah, the, one of the big factors is, and you, you'll not find this on some of the higher, um, the ones that are brighter, is uh, kind of in the fine print, suitable for enclosed fixtures. If it doesn't have that on, and you put it in even something like this, like a you know, kind of somewhat enclosed fixture, they generate some heat, not a whole lot of heat, uh, and that heat is going to kind of fry the electronics over a period of time, so it won't last nearly as long. But um, yeah, there's, there's ones like if, you, if it has a guarantee and you buy it from a, a reputable store, you could bring it back and say, this, this light did not last as long as it, it, it should have and oftentimes they'll do a replacement. But yeah, the quality is not as good as they used to be, partly because they're now so much cheaper. And so you'll notice that compared to say five years ago, 10 years ago, much cheaper lights, but not quite as many hours that they last, but still thousands of hours typically, much longer than an incandescent light bulb. Um, so here's just some other things to think about, and this is related to your hot water heating costs, domestic hot water. And so there's a lot of opportunities for do-it-yourself aspects there. It uh, can be as simple as just turning down the hot water so that it's not scalding hot when it com comes out of the, uh, the tap. You know, it should be just kind of barely tolerable for a second or so coming out of the tap. Um, that's about 120 degrees. Installing pipe insulation is a good do-it-yourself project. In my opinion, it's worth spending a little extra and getting you know, a thick pipe insulation rather than just a little thin pipe insulation because uh, if you're going to go to the trouble of doing that installation, you might as well you know, do it as, as well as you can. Uh, can you put that pipe insulation over PEX lines versus copper? It's hard with PEX lines. That's what I don't like about PEX because the little holders for it are so close to the wall that it's hard to get pipe insulation, so you might have to use the, the thinner wall material just to get it all the way around. But it doesn't hurt the picks. It's certainly not going to hurt. The only, only uh, lines that you don't want to use that type of insulation for would be a steam line, and those are typically kind of the cast iron, and it's not very common around here. And then this is kind of a simple thing, and that is to get like lower flow faucet aerators and shower heads. Um, a lot of shower heads are 2.5 gallons per minute rated, and you can get a pretty decent shower head for one point at, rated at 1.5 gallons per minute. And same thing with faucet aerators, where your standard aerator is 2.2 gallons per minute, uh, a lower flow one is about one, you can even go down to half a gallon per minute. So there's some good opportunities there. <laughs> and then just things like washing clothes in cold water, you know, for the most part, our clothes are going to get pretty much the same amount of clean in cold water as, as in hot water. And then just some other actions. I mentioned dehumidifiers. You know, one of the things that I would recommend if you have a dehumidifier is just getting a simple like $10 hardware store humidity meter and see what the humidity level is where you have it set up in the garage or whatever. 
Um, and a lot of these will actually kind of have high and low settings so you can see what the range is. And really, for the most part, you don't need to go below about 60%, maybe even 70% relative humidity. Uh, and so, you know, you kind of adjust the dehumidifier so it's not, you're not trying to dehumidify the world, you're just trying to dehumidify de the basement at a reasonable level. And then line dry and close outside. I know some people will do that all winter long. I'm not one of those, but uh, good thing to do if you're doing it outside. I'm, I don't tend to recommend doing it inside, maybe, but we'll talk a little bit more about humidification and some of the issues there in houses. And then just purchasing those more efficient appliances, which have that Energy Star label. So, um, you know, looking for that label, and then you can go to uh, energystar.gov, which has listings of appliances, and then the NewHampshireSaves.com has uh, information and forms for all these different appliance rebates. So clothes dryers, clothes washers, dehumidifiers, refrigerators, room air conditioners, even more than that. And then there's also this kind of neat program that if you have a second refrigerator or freezer and it's still functional and you really don't need it any longer, they will pay you $75 to haul it away and they'll environmentally recycle it as well. And this is where people kind of scratch their heads and are like, this is the electric company and they're going to pay me to, to haul away something that uses electricity? Well, you know, it's all about cost-effective energy efficiency. And so this was, I think, a pretty clever idea of theirs to say, hmm, you know, we can have, help households save a lot of electricity by uh, uh, helping them get rid of that second refrigerator that they might not be using very much. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question because the, the outfit that did it, uh, and I say it in past tense, uh, went bankrupt not too long ago. So, Ted, do you know, have they found a new contractor? I haven't heard about that. Yeah, so it might be the kind of thing where if you call them up, uh, they might say, we'll put you on a list. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's, a, it's a contractor that, that does it for them. Who are you calling? You would be calling like customer service with uh, your electric utility. Yeah. Could you replace that freezer with a, high, uh, a new efficient one? Yeah, and you could certainly do that and you know, look for the ones that are Energy Star rated and go after that, um, the rebate that you can get. And they do make it relatively easy where you can fill in that rebate online and take a picture of the receipt and send it in. Still takes a little bit of time to, to get the actual rebate. Good questions, yeah. 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 There's a lot of little fine print like that, so I didn't know that. So that's that's good to know. It's only two appliances per year. Refrigerator, washer, and dryer. Okay. Huh. Interesting. And the refrigerator has to be working. Can't wait until it dies. Yeah. No. That you know, it's not that doesn't really help produce the electrical consumption if it's already dead. So kind of move, anybody have any other questions about kind of the things that I've been covering about like electricity savings and things like that? Because we're kind of moving to this section about heating and keeping your houses warm in the wintertime. Keep on going. And I've got a couple slides at the end about the Inflation Reduction Act and kind of the rebates and incentives associated with that. It sometimes, particularly with, with questions and answers, it might push a little bit after more than an hour and a half, but hopefully that's not going to be a problem for you folks. Uh, and hopefully we'll get out of here well before the library closes. So is that all right? Yeah. Or, you know, if you're, doesn't, doesn't bother me too much if you're, you, we hit 8.30 and you've got to go or something like that. I mean, 7.30, sorry. We, and you've got to go. Um, so we, today's a good day for it where we, you know, we need to heat our homes to keep it warm and really, the, the goal here is to have a home that's efficient enough that we don't act like this person. Uh, it's comfortable and we're not using a lot of fuels to heat that home. Um, so it's not just a matter of turning down the thermostat, although that certainly can help. It's a matter of having a home that is efficient and is very comfortable to be in. 
And uh, that's one of the things that, that we noticed. We did a, I have about a 1910 home, so it had some, some challenges from an energy perspective. And we finally kind of did a <coughs> kind of deep retrofit project about 12 years ago. And one of the things that was really a nice, pleasant realization was just how much more comfortable it was in the wintertime after doing all that, in addition to the, the energy and cost savings that we had. So here's just kind of some quick tips, uh, turning down the heat when you're not in a room or not in the house, uh, using programmable or smart thermostats. People ask the question, you know, if you turn down the heat at night and then it has to come back on in the morning, are you really saving energy? The way to think about that is that if it goes down, whether it's at night or during the day, and it stays down at that lower temperature for a while and then goes back up, you're definitely saving energy while it's at that lower temperature. And it's something on the order of like 2% or so in energy savings for every one degree thermostat you turn down. So it's, it's a fair amount when you are able to turn it down uh, relatively low. But that also depends on whether you have variable electric rates. Like for instance, if you had a much lower rate overnight, maybe you heat it up five degrees extra and not use the expensive stuff during the day. Yeah, and we're kind of moving in that direction. Unitil offers that. It's not very common. I don't know very many people who've kind of taken them up on that offer, but we're moving towards this idea that electricity, if you look at it, kind of the spot market for electricity, it's a lot more expensive at certain kind of peak usage times, like from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. It's, that's kind of peak usage, and so there's just a lot more demand for electricity versus at nighttime. So we may be moving into systems where that can take advantage, like you mentioned, of the potentially lower rates uh, at night. Or there are some systems out there that just aren't very good about kind of going down to a lower temperature and coming back up again. So you have to kind of take into account what is your system able to do. But you know, things like just removing window air conditioning units, latching windows, you'd be surprised at, because I've done a lot of energy audits over the years, just how many windows in the middle of the winter weren't completely latched or they're you know, cracked open but they were behind a curtain and people never noticed them, things like that. Um, and uh, now's a good time to be closing those storm windows if you haven't done that already, if you've got those. And so kind of a little bit of building science here, that heat, uh, if you think of your house this time of year as being warmer than outside, that heat is always trying to kind of escape out. And it can escape out in a couple different ways. And so we're going to talk about conduction, convection, and radiative heat transfer. So conduction is heat transfer through materials. So it's kind of like those molecules kind of vibrating more and transferring, transferring through materials. Or the simple version of conduction is like if you put a hot poker in a fire and it's metal, you might notice it, your you know, hand feeling a little uncomfortable after a period of time. Or convection, think of that as more heat transfer through air movement. Um, and we'll talk more about that. And then radiation or radiative heat transfer is heat transfer through a line of sight. So the sun is radiative heat transfer it's through a vacuum. In essence, you know, there's basically space in between us, the earth and the sun, but there's a lot of heat coming from the sun through that mechanism. Not as much this time of year because the sun's just not nearly as strong. So kind of talk a, a bit about conduction. And really, the opposite of conduction is insulation. So that's what you want to have happen in your house, is have it well insulated so it's not conducting that heat uh, out through walls and through basements and through ceilings and whatnot. Um, a material that is not a very good conductor is anything that's kind of like masonry type materials. So stone, concrete, uh, bricks. All those materials, they can hold a lot of heat, but they actually conduct a lot of heat from inside to outside. So for example, you have a concrete basement wall that's not insulated. There's probably quite a bit of heat that's getting conducted through that, that concrete uh, basement wall. And there's lots of different materials that can be used as insulators. This is kind of like that museum of, of uh, weird insulation. Uh, that I've always thought, you know, would be a neat, neat little mini museum of the bizarre things that people have used for insulation. Seaweed over on the left, uh, over on the right is old rags for insulation. And then back in the 50s, 
like a little inch thick uh, of this balsam wool insulation, that was considered an insulated house, you know, about an inch of it. Well, we've come quite a ways since, since then. And so different types of materials can be used for insulation. I'll just pass around a couple examples. Um, this is basically ground up newsprint that is called cellulose. So it originally came from trees. And then this, oftentimes it's pink or yellow or other colors, but this is kind of as the name implies, fiberglass. It's just kind of like not too much different than, than what might be in a, uh, a winter jacket or something like that, but it comes in bats in big rolls. And there's different types of foam materials. So different types of foam materials have different R values. This is a little bit higher R value per inch, the polyisocyanurate, than the extruded or XPS polystyrene. And then this is a little bit aged, but this is um, a spray foam material. And one of the nice benefits of something like this is that it air seals as well as insulates because it's sprayed on to, to surfaces. And uh, could I get a guinea pig to come up here and for a little demonstration of, of conduction? There's nothing dangerous or anything. Go for it. Thank you. So all you need to do is just put one hand on one of these discs and another hand on the other disc. At the same time? Yep, and just tell me which one, which one, you're not gonna get shocked or anything. Tell me which one is warmer and which one is colder. This one's warmer. That one's warmer? This one, yeah, this one's cold. And so what's interesting is that these are both the same temperature, but what the, the difference is, this one, if you feel it, it's a lot heavier yeah. than one that feels colder because it's aluminum. So that's a conductive material, whereas this is kind of an insulating material. Sure, yeah, thank you. And um, it's kind of the same idea as like, you know, if you walk around, maybe not so much this time of year, but in the summertime, and you walk from like a carpeted room to a, uh, a tiled room, and you're like, oh gosh, that tile floor is so much colder. Probably it's about, though they're, they're probably about the same temperature, but what's happening is that with that conductive material, it's sucking more heat out of your feet or out of your hands. And so that's what you don't want to have happen with your house. You want to have a house that has good insulating materials. And so, you know, the things I was passing around are just common insulating materials. A lot of these are in the range of like R three and a half to R seven per inch. And if you add multiple inches of them, you're getting some pretty good insulating kind of layers there. But I will point out, like I was talking about before, for eight inches of concrete, it's about R1. That's for eight inches, that's not even per inch. So they, you know, it's kind of the fact that they can hold a lot of heat, they have a lot of thermal mass, masks the fact that uh, they are uh, kind of a big avenue for losing heat through conductive heat loss. I have a question about spray foam. Sure. There's a big company in New Hampshire that offers spray foam uh, into external walls. I think you're talking about like the kind of the fill-in foam where they kind of drill a hole yeah, or... Yeah, drill a hole. Yep. And it basically overwhelms the, uh, the fiberglass insulation that's already in that cavity. In theory. I just question whether that's a good idea. Yeah. If you compress, if you compress uh, that uh, insulation... The, uh, the, uh, I think, you know, the general principle when you have a wall cavity or any cavity that already has insulation in it, particularly like fiberglass, is that it's just, it's more difficult to get more insulation in there. And the fact that it already has some means that it already has some insulating qualities. Um, I don't wanna remark about, you know, cause that's kind of a proprietary process, but I've seen other outfits that have done that. You know, the material that is in, it's called injection foam. And the material that, that foam, it's sort of like shaving cream consistency. It's much different than like that uh, spray foam that I passed around, which is a closed cell, high density uh, spray foam. So it's a lot different in its kind of qualities. And if they, you know, if they're able to kind of get in there and do all that, all power to them. But there's another way of kind of doing that at a much lower cost that, in my opinion, is, you know, a better value, which is, drill a hole 
and potentially move the fiberglass around a bit and dense pack it with that cellulose material that I just passed around. Mm -hmm. So, um, something you can't undo if it doesn't work. Yeah, that's, that's the big problem with spray foam. <coughs> if you have a historical structure, you know, you definitely want to think twice about using spray foam because it's just very sticky. Once it's on there, it's very, very difficult to remove. Whereas something like cellulose or even fiberglass or even some of the foam boards, they're not that difficult to remove. And don't you, you lose most of your heat through the uh, not uh, I've got a slide coming up about that, and, and, and that kind of depends on kind of how you think about it. So that's a, that's a good question. We'll save that one for just in a couple slides. Okay, what can you say about fire resistance? Yeah, so why don't we, uh, how about I'll save the, the spray foam related uh, questions and fire resistance and spray foam is a big one to we've got some slides that show uh, some examples of spray foam and so it kind of depends on essentially is there a layer that is fire resistant between you and, and some of those materials but we'll kind of save that for for a little bit lots of good questions here this is great stone and brick and things like that. Um, using some kind of a dead air space or something. So that they're not yeah, I mean, I love old stone houses, but when I look at them from an energy perspective, it's like, oh. Yeah, we actually had somebody, it was kind of towards Keene at a button up, and he had a concrete house, and he was saying he was getting oil deliveries of something like 100 gallons every other week or, or something just crazy and it's just like uh yeah they're they're challenge they are definitely there are challenges um you know if you have a nice smooth concrete um foundation wall then it's relatively easy to put something like this poly iso if it's a particular one that is fire rated which i'll talk about um, but if it's like an uneven brick or rubble stone or granite or whatever Really, spray foam is the only kind of workable option in terms of how it functions. Uh, and that might not be, you know, very easy to do. Yeah. Um, or just might not be feasible, you know, in certain I've, situations. I've heard of a, a few more modern, um, basically concrete houses that were very energy efficient. Yeah, there are there's what's called ICF, insulated concrete forms. So it's concrete, but then it has an insulating layer on either side of it. And so that can be very, very efficient. But just the exposed concrete by itself is not, not so. All right, lots of good questions. Hopefully we'll get through all the slides here. Um, and this is just kind of showing, you know, these are just some rough numbers, but you know, there is, we do have a, a quite a good energy code now, and you know, City of Concord does a good job in terms of inspections of new construction and all. But there's a lot of houses out there, even ones that aren't that old, that because they are a little bit lax in terms of the install quality and things like that, just are not functioning uh, anywhere close to what the energy code says they should be functioning at. And so this is kind of an example of that. So let's say that we're kind of have a bird's eye view of an attic and it looks like this. And you're like, yeah, there's a few spots that are missing insulation, those gray areas. Um, but the rest, that white area, you know, is, looks like it's pretty well installed or pretty well covered. So we're saying 95% of the area is covered with R38 insulation and you can see down to the drywall for the 5% of the area. What is the average R value of an assembly like that? Any guesses? It's R13. So in other words, that 5% of the area that's not insulated has like more heat loss than the whole 95% of the area that's pretty well insulated. And does that happen a lot with recessed lights? Uh, yeah, yeah, bathroom fans, attic hatches, you know, all sorts of things. And so it's kind of, sometimes it's not so much, you know, the, the quantity, it's really the quality, how well the install takes place, uh, particularly with insulation. And so examples, you know, this is kind of a classic, not enough insulation. This is a bathroom fan, that's a ceiling light, but you can see it's very little insulation there. This, they added insulation, but they, for one reason or another, uh, didn't put the insulation there, or they moved it around. So that's having some major challenges in terms of heat loss. 
and then anybody figure out what the problem is on that, that rightmost picture? Yeah, so this is a vertical wall, uh, and it's kind of more common than you might think uh, in houses where there's kind of transitions and things like that. They insulated this part of the vertical wall, but they basically forgot to insulate this part. And even the amount of insulation here is going to be not nearly as much as what you would see in a typical attic. Um, so that is not a very good performing vertical wall at all. So if you Well, yeah, it, it kind of all depends. It's a good question, but if it's a good quality, say like an LED light that's rated for insulation contact and is considered airtight, so it's also not leaking air, then you can insulate around that. Um, and the same thing with a good quality bathroom fan that is venting all the way to outside. This one shouldn't be like this, where it's just venting into the attic. And so a lot of those can be, you can essentially insulate on top of them if they're, if they're rated for such. But some of the older versions of those aren't rated for having insulation contact. And so that just kind of creates sort of like Swiss cheese of your attic in terms of insulation. So this is kind of related to a question that one of you all just asked, you know, is it kind of makes sense to really kind of put all that insulation up in the attic and not worry as much about the, the rest of the areas. So heat rises, true or false? True? Sort of. So keep in mind that when we're talking about conduction and heat <coughs> loss through conduction, it can basically, there's no gravity that's involved with heat loss through conduction. So it can basically go in any direction. You know, one of the most uncomfortable kind of houses around here would be what's called a slab on grade house where the slab is not insulated. And essentially the heat is going out through that concrete slab to the ground and, and outside. That's a very uncomfortable, inefficient house. So in terms of conductive heat loss, it can go in any direction. But you're sort of right in the sense that with warm air, it does tend to rise, kind of like a hot air balloon. And so you might notice that the upper parts of your house might be a bit warmer than the lower parts of your house, particularly on a, a winter day or even on a summer day where the cold air kind of drops down into the basement. But this is a different type of heat transfer mechanism. This is convection as opposed to conduction. So we're kind of moving from the conductive heat transfer, working on the insulation to fix that, to convective heat transfer, which we typically call air leakage, and air sealing is the way to, to compact that. And so that, that uh, convective heat transfer has to do with just the properties of air. As it warms up, it tends to rise, and as it cools down, it tends to fall, um, just like a hot air balloon. And so that can be like in a room, say like with a wood stove, cold window, you know, wood stove heats up there, the cold window uh, cools it down. That's with no basically air transfer between inside and outside. It's just happening in that room. Or, the kind of the bigger picture of how a lot of homes lose a lot of heat around here is the fact that there's small cracks and the warm air is leaking out up high because it tends to be more buoyant and then cold air from outside is replacing it down low. And that's called air leakage. So the, the highest priority in terms of air sealing, it, and, and, and you might wonder like, well, why is the standard only like R21 for walls for insulation and it's R49 for the attic. It's just more that we're, we don't build walls that wide. It really means that walls kind of just by, by energy code are a little bit less performing than a typical attic. There's more room in the attic for insulation so we put more there. But it doesn't mean that, <clears throat> that you know, that heat transfer by conduction is any less uh, through the wall than it is through the attic. But for air leakage, it does make a difference where you are in the house. Um, so that, <clears throat> that transition between the, uh, the, the top kind of living area and the attic or outside is a big area in terms of that warm air escaping out of the house. And the same, same token, 
you know, so that's kind of the highest priority in terms of air sealing. And the same token down in the basement is pretty high priority as well because you want to stop that cold air coming in. Um, the center of the house, there just aren't as many opportunities and there isn't quite as much of a pressure difference as well. Um, so that's why we kind of say A, B, and C. Attic, basement, and center is kind of the prioritization of thinking about um, stopping that heat transfer through convection or through air leakage. So here's some examples. And so because we're talking about a pressure difference, you know, with insulation, we're trying to kind of cover big areas. With a pressure difference, we're trying to kind of seal up uh, an area. So, you know, I like to, to think of the analogy of uh, I've got a, uh, a used uh, inflatable raft that I could sell you. Certainly not the right time of year to be doing that. But it's only got, you know, cracks and holes for 2% of its surface area. I'll sell it to you cheap for, you know, 15 bucks. Would you want to buy an inflatable raft like that? And it's a kind of the same concept with a house, is that what you're trying to do is to get it so there isn't that much of that warm air leaking out and cold air leaking in. There's always going to be some, but you're trying to reduce it. And there's actually a fair amount of houses that are actually losing more heat from air leakage than they are losing heat from lack of insulation. But because we don't really we don't notice it that much, we don't tend to focus on it that much. And so I like to tell people that you kind of need to have like these two different nodes in your brain, you know, kind of the air leakage node and the, uh, and the uh, conductive heat loss or convective heat loss and conductive heat loss nodes because there are a little bit different mechanisms about how the, uh, the heat escapes out of a house. So, you know, notice like these little uh, holes and cracks or around the ceiling light or bath fan. You know, this, in my opinion, is like a super highway for air leakage. You know, it doesn't look like that big, but it's a, that's actually a very big kind of avenue for air leakage. And then, you know, a broken duct or the tops of interior walls. So basically, the junction in the attic where that interior wall hits up with the attic, that can be kind of a, a kind of long linear crack but that can be quite a bit of air leakage right there. So here's another quiz for you. Pegboard attic hatch with 16 inches of fiberglass insulation. Is that a good assembly or not so good assembly? Not so, good. so the 16 inches of fiberglass is good. The holes, the pegboard attic hatch, not so good. A lot of air leakage going through that into the attic, not so good. So it's, it's again, so it's kind of two nodes of your brain that you want to kind of go after both of them. And one of the problems is that if you do have a lot of air leakage going into an attic in the winter time, and this is, uh, can be kind of the bigger, bigger problem the colder it gets, uh, and also kind of particularly big problem, say like February, March, where the sun starts getting stronger, that it could cause something like this. And you might think, well, that's probably like, you know, a leaky roof or something like that. No, nope, that is indoor humidity that comes with the air, leaks into the attic, and then it condenses on the underside of the attic. And then like February, March, the sun's getting stronger. The attic might warm up in the daytime, cool off at night, and cause mold and other issues like that. Not so good. And a way to kind of combat that is attic ventilation can help, but the kind of getting it at the source would be air sealing that, that attic plane so you don't have that humidity coming up through the air into the attic. And so that was the A of the A, B, and C. So down in the basement, you know, any place where you can see daylight, that, that is an area that you could go after in terms of air sealing. Um, any of these what we call penetration, so it could be like plumbing pipes or electrical wires or oil fill tube or something like that. Uh, the junction where kind of the basement, the foundation meets the framing part of the house, that's another big area as well. And then uh, the center of the house, so the C and the A, B, and C, not as many opportunities, but there's some. A lot of people don't realize that there's just a ton of air leakage that can go up through a, a chimney that has an open flue like that. Um, and we're kind of getting at here kind of the problems. I'm going to have more slides about 
the solutions with some of these. So if you're wondering, hey, all sorts of problems, but how do I fix these things? You'll see some more slides in just a little bit. A lot of people think their windows have a lot of air leakage, but it's more that windows are really not that great of an insulator. And so what's happening is that on a really cold day, there's kind of an area of cold air near that window because it's the, the heat is kind of sucking out, just like that, that aluminum disc. And so if you're sitting next to a window, you might notice a little kind of draftiness, and that's a convective current that's interior of the house. It's not so much cold air that's, that's leaking in. So, you know, a lot of times when I start talking about air sealing, air leakage and air sealing, people think, well, I don't really want to seal up my house completely. You know, I still want to have oxygen to breathe and things like that. Um, we can measure really well how well air sealed houses are with a blower door, which I'll show a picture of in a little bit. But a lot of homes are just more leaky than they should be. And so certainly we can get down to a level where the, the air leakage is reasonable and not excessive. And that's really kind of what, what the goal is. Or if you're building a new, new house, you could um, use something like this, a heat recovery ventilator that basically exhausts stale air from inside, brings in fresh air from outside, and has a heat exchanger that kind of basically that stale air that's getting exhausted out gets preheated by, uh, or the, the stale air is preheating the, the, the fresh air that's coming in. Or, you know, it can be as simple as having a good quality bathroom fan that provides the right amount of kind of moisture control and things like that. So this is what you don't want to have happen with your bathroom fan. And that is there's a lot of houses where unfortunately that, that moist air is getting exhausted into the attic rather than outside. And so not a good idea. And uh, kind of along those lines, um, this is, you know, kind of a basket case of a basement. It's hard to see, but there's condensation with the plastic here on the inside of the plastic. This is standing water. Um, you know, hopefully your basement's nothing as bad as that, but there are more, uh, basements, crawl spaces can be kind of a big areas of moisture, even if there isn't standing water. Um, so you want to kind of be paying attention to that sort of thing. And I would say, you know, a good, a sign of a good energy auditor is they do pay attention to moisture in terms of humidity or sources of moisture, what might happen. Because um, if you do air seal a house, you are kind of bottling up that moisture more than, than before. In many ways, that's a good thing because our houses are too dry in the wintertime. Um, they should have a higher humidity level and air sealing would help uh, increase that humidity level. But you also want to be thinking are there any kind of negatives that could be happening if you had a, a wet basement or say a crawl space with a dirt floor that can be a lot of humidity coming just from that, even if it doesn't look all that wet. That can happen, yep. So, you know, there's examples of houses that get like spray foamed and the, didn't really get an energy audit and they didn't, you know, didn't really kind of go through with the homeowner all the kind of ramifications. <laughs> um, and a house that was, you know, reasonably dry before but had a wet basement, now that moisture is more bottled up and turned into kind of a much more moldy condition throughout the house than what they had before. So. Uh, those are the kind of things that, you know, a good quality energy auditor is going to make sure to avoid those, that sort of situation. So what's the biggest factor causing ice dams with this house? And this, this picture came from Vermont, so we can say that this doesn't happen in New Hampshire, right? No problems like this in New Hampshire. Yeah, so it, it's a kind of an antique cape, and it did have not quite good enough, but it did have an insulating layer between the living space and this, this attic area. But the, the big problem was that there was basically no air sealing of that, that boundary. And so a lot of warm air got up into the attic and melted the snow off the roof and just, you know, got worse and worse. This is really pretty extreme. And some winters we have, I consider kind of more ice dam winters than, than others. 
Last winter was, you know, the ground hardly froze, so we didn't have much problems with ice dams, but some winters are, are worse than others. Certainly not something you want to have happen with your house, because the problem is, is that not only does it cause icicles, but the freeze-thaw action um, from ice damming can get into the exterior walls and cause all sorts of damage. So, something to keep in mind. I'd say, you know, if you have icicles anywhere in your house that get more than, say, like two feet or so, you should be thinking, where's all that heat loss coming from? So, is this the solution? Roof melt tablets? Safe and easy way to get rid of damaging ice dams on your roof? That's sort of like saying, you know, oh, I've got a headache. I think I need to take an aspirin. That's going to solve my headache, right? It's like, maybe there's something else you could do. Uh, so that's one of the nice things about good weatherization work, going after those air leakage and going after those areas that aren't well insulated, that ice dams can you know, virtually disappear. So here's kind of getting into that. Uh, we looked at problems. Here's some examples of solutions, particularly related to insulation and air sealing. So first, air sealing this attic plane and then adding a lot of insulation. And this is that blown in cellulose. Um, and this is something, you know, you could do this as a do-it-yourselfer, both the air sealing and the insulation. You can rent uh, insulation blowers from places like Lowe's and Home Depot. But, you know, you may want to, it's sort of like, yeah, you could work on your car as well, but do you really want to change the oil yourself and, and all that? Um, so we'll talk a little bit more down in just a bit about working with a professional. Uh, and here's an example. This is kind of more extreme than, than, than some, but this is where they used spray foam as kind of like an inch or so layer, what we call kind of like a skim coat. Could be like an old house that had a lot of like lath and plaster and a lot of little cracks. Um, and so did the, the air sealing with that spray foam and then they'd add cellulose on top of that. So from a fire, uh, fire rated perspective, that's not a problem because the cellulose is considered um, on top of that, of that spray foam. But generally speaking, and in the attic, if it's, nobody's accessing it really, that's not as much of an issue. It's more some of these other slides I'm going to be showing where we're talking about um, spaces that people can access is you don't want to have exposed foam, basically. Um, and then this is an example using fire rated materials of going after that super highway for, for air leakage, which is the chimney chase. But again, I would recommend uh, working with somebody who knows how to do that because there's only certain types of caulk that would be rated for that kind of application. And this is a metal type material that's, that's fireproof. Um, so there's certainly ways not to do that. And then here's some examples of uh, attics and storage. This is a pull down stairs, kind of a big area for both uh, lack of insulation and air leakage. And then just some examples of kind of, you know, it's oftentimes a bit of a compromise about if you want to have storage in the attic, then are you going to raise that level of the floor or are you just kind of a small area with less insulation and then another area with more insulation. But you notice how around the attic hatch, you know, we're talking about quite a big insulation dam to get that 16 inches plus of insulation in the area. And then this is a uh, cape style house. So a lot of them have these triangular knee walls that are kind of outside of the living area on the second floor. And so one approach, a lot of times it, it, uh, they might be originally insulated on the floor and then the, the, uh, the vertical part. But generally speaking, a preferable way is to go down the slope. So it just kind of makes this warm, even though it's not officially a, a, a living area. Um, and this type of material, if it's Thermax, which is a certain type of foam, is rated for being exposed in a situation like that. If it was something like, I believe, and it's, you know, some of these are a little bit gray areas, but if it was something like this, uh, or if it was most types of spray foam, those would not be rated for being exposed. They might need some type of covering. And so something like this, this is spray foam in a similar type of area, but they're gonna put drywall um, between the, the, where people live and the, uh, and the spray foam, and that's considered a fire barrier. So it's kind of getting at your questions about fire, fire issues and all with uh, 
materials like this. So that was kind of the A of the A, B, and C down in the basement, you know, going after uh, basement doors, uh, things like that. This would be both insulating and air sealing, trying to, you know, achieve both there. And then basement walls. Again, this is a thermax that would be rated for, as long as it's not a living area, but if it's area you just access to for like storage, then that particular brand of foam board is okay, but other ones wouldn't be. And again, this also, this is a spray foam that has a covering of what's called intumescent paint, which is a, a fire barrier. So, and this would be before the drywall goes on. So, um, you know, all of them you have to, any, anytime you're using foam materials, you have to be thinking, is there a, f a fire uh, issue? Because they're all flammable and the gases they produce when they catch on fire are very toxic or very unpleasant gases. So it's, it's kind of a particular type of material that you have to be careful about in terms of exposure, lefting exposed in terms of a fire danger. So the center of the house, you can get these chimney flue blockers. There's things you can do in terms of like exterior doors and weather stripping. There's areas like this. Sometimes they're exposed, a lot of times they're not. Uh, in terms of around chimneys. So there's a number of different things that you can do air sealing wise, but they might be somewhat limited in the center of the house. And then this is what I was talking about as kind of an alternative to the foam in place. This is like a kind of semi-rigid tube that goes up into the wall and it goes, gets, you can use it to kind of push the insulation around if there is some, and it, it packs in very densely that cellulose material. And that is good at both air sealing as well as insulating those, those walls. It's much easier to do if there's no insulation in those walls. And then if you have any ductwork, the sticky gooey stuff called mastic is used. It's the best material for uh, sealing the uh, duct seams because it, it, it lasts a long time. You know, the kind of ironic thing is that duct tape shouldn't be used on ducts. Uh, <laughs> and the reason why is because the, the uh, the adhesive basically dries out after a period of time, six months, a year, or something like that. Um, I was just at a uh, window dressers community build in New London, and this is an example of an interior storm that uh, is uh, kind of sponsored by this not-for-profit group that's out of Maine. Anybody heard of window dressers? So. Um, could be something you know for the Concord as a community to do. They're very inexpensive because they're basically built with mostly volunteer labor, and they're basically these inserts that go as kind of like an interior storm window on the in the inside of a house. And as you can see, they're wood frame and they have two layers of plastic that's pretty clear, um, and they tend to be you know kind of varies on what size window you have, but they're around maybe 45 bucks or so, much less expensive than other options. And, and for anybody who has inefficient windows, which really is most all of us, because windows just aren't very efficient in terms of the insulator, they can kind of make a difference. Um, so I know I think Canterbury is, is, Canterbury and Loudoun might be doing a window dressers community <coughs> build next year. New London and Kearsarge area probably will do, be doing it again. And uh, I think maybe the Conway area. So something to think about for, for Concord as well, because I think they're kind of a nifty idea. I made one of those like 30 years ago. Of course, I didn't know the yarning book. And you know, as far as cost, it was like two, three bucks. Yeah, yeah. If you've got the woodworking. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the community bill is kind of neat. It's like they have these sort of contraptions to kind of make the, the build part a lot easier. And it's just kind of a nice, it's sort of like a barn raising kind of event. Um, but it does take a lot of, lot of labor. And there's other things that, you know, you can do as well with windows. Do they do that by house? Like, so they'll do like kind of like a community will create window dressers for a whole house. Is that what they're Yeah, so basically somebody will come out and they'll measure the window. So it's basically custom measured for each window. And so like I know a house that got like 14 of these. Um, you know, it might not be each and every window, but a good number of windows. And uh, they, I think the only, you know, a typical community build is only around 300 windows, but
but if it's done kind of year over year, then you can kind of get on the list. And they also have a program where it's a not-for-profit organization, so they also have a program where they are um, allowing people who are lower income to get these for free uh, or at low cost. So it's, it's, it's a neat uh, organization, windowdressers.org. And uh, a lot of these are happening in Maine, um, not as many in New Hampshire. So there's kind of more potential to do more of these community builds in, in New Hampshire. And there's other options as well. It's just, uh, you know, replacing a window that might already have a storm window and getting a new vinyl window. You just might not get that much energy savings uh, from that. And for the cost, 500, 600, 800 dollars, you know, you're certainly not getting a whole lot of bang for the buck in terms of energy savings. So windows, you know, they're certainly kind of um, weak links in terms of insulation, but they're kind of somewhat limited options in, in, in cost-effective uh, energy improvements with them. Feeling overwhelmed? <laughs> Where are we at time-wise? Yeah, so we're, we're getting there. So now it kind of gets into you sort of gotten some quick tips, learned a little bit of building science, a little bit about air leakage and conductive heat loss. Um, and now you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe there are some things that need to happen in my house. Uh, one thing that I had a question on. Sure. And that is I have a dryer. And, you know, when it originally came, it was little louvers at the end. Suppose they blow open when the dryer was blowing open and they fall back down. Of course, you know, those don't work anymore. And, you know, I have this, you know, pipe that sticks out and, you know, that's an insulation loss. And so, I mean, do people have a way of uh, putting a block in the dryer vent and you can really open it up on the dryer Yeah, I mean, there, there are better quality and lower quality, um, what we call vent hoods. And the ones that are better quality, I think, are less the louvered ones and one that just have basically a flap with a you know, piece of metal that, that gets pushed out by the force of the air. And then they'll, what you want to look for is how well it seals when, um, when that flap closes back again. And the good quality ones will have like a little kind of gasket type seal. And they might cost 20 bucks rather than 15 bucks or something like that. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation for something like that is to replace it with a better quality one. Pretty much these days you want to use all metal for a dryer vent just for safety reasons because particularly if you have propane or natural gas for your clothes dryer, it's amazing how many um, clothes dryer fires there are a year in the US. And it's from the lint that gets built up. You know, that's one of the reasons why you want to clean your lint filter um, every time you use the clothes dryer. But if lint gets into that, it can actually cause, it's just like tinder, and it can cause a, a dryer fire. If it's an all metal uh, vent, vent pipe, then it likely will stay contained inside that pipe. If it was plastic, it could, it could get into the house. So there's kind of a health and safety issue as well as a efficiency issues there. But have you ever heard of anything like a valve that you know, sits inside the window so you leave it closed until you open the dryer and then you open up the valve? And you I, think, I think most, uh, and some of them, you know, they get kind of caught with lint and things like that so they don't work as well. But I think there is a, a damper in dryers as well. There may or may not be. I mean, you can try to feel around your dryer on a cold day and feel if there's cold air coming in. And if that's the case, then you probably want to look at at least getting a good quality vent hood. But uh, no, not, not that I'm aware of. And I think partly, you know, you, we're kind of in that borderline zone of talking about efficiency, but also making sure that there aren't any health and safety concerns uh, with it. All right, I'm going to keep on going because I've got a few more slides and I want to get through reasonable time here. Um, so one of the things that you could be doing is getting a whole house energy audit and that you know they, they vary a lot in terms of how they are but the ones that are done through the New Hampshire SAIS program it's about a $500 value energy audit and um, you know they'll look at the heating system look at health and safety issues with it things like a clothes dryer vent hood if there are any issues there but also do like a blower door test um, and sometimes do like infrared imaging and things like that and typically come up with a written report that could be uh, done through energy modeling where it kind of shows the actual energy savings for each measure 
or often what's kind of more typical is kind of a prioritized list of recommended improvements. And that can come in really handy, particularly if you think, you know, you're thinking about different options or you know your house has kind of got pretty high energy bills or things like that. So things to look for in terms of energy auditors, there's certifications. There's a group called the Residential Energy Performance Association. Um, their full, full members have been vetted for their energy auditing capabilities. New Hampshire Saves, it's not an easily accessible list, but I'll show you uh, kind of a way to get a list of the, all the different contractors that are working with their home performance program, like TED and uh, Yankee Thermal Imaging is, is, is one of those contractors. So I mentioned the blower door. This is what it looks like. It goes into an exterior door. It has like a nylon frame or a nylon panel and an adjustable frame. So it adjusts a different size. And it's just like basically a big uh, exhaust fan. It's exhausting a lot of air through that big round fan. And it's getting a pressure difference between inside and outside, a standard pressure difference of 50 pascals, negative 50 pascals. So the reading that we get off a blower door is a CFM 50 reading, cubic feet per minute of air flowing through that fan at a 50 pascal pressure difference between inside and outside. So it's kind of a standardized measure. And that's really handy because like I said before, you might not notice that there's a bunch of warm air leaking into your attic because it's a very kind of subtle, subtle current. But with a blower door, you would find out is you know, your house kind of better than average, worse than average, or just you know, off the charts bad or something like that. I've seen a lot of houses where you look at them on the outside and you think, hmm, you know, that house looks pretty nice. And then all of a sudden you do a blower door test and it's like, wow, there's a lot of air leakage in this house, even though it's only 15 years old, you know, things like that. So you learn a lot. Uh, auditors learn a lot and homeowners learn a lot having that blower door test. And it can be used also for, for good crews that are doing that air sealing work will use a blower door as part of their air sealing work. Um, blower door guided air sealing is what they call it. And did you mention that that's required in the new energy code for all new construction? Yeah, so that's, it's, it's required but not enforced very much. So hopefully here in Concord it happens, but you go to some of the smaller towns and they're like, blower door, what's that? But at least, you know, on paper, every new home should have is required to have a blower door test and meet a certain standard in terms of air, air sealing. Uh, a pretty good standard, actually. But it's, it's not, not enforced uh, throughout the state. And so this is also a handy tool. Sometimes it's done with a blower door, but it's an infrared camera. So it's just basically, rather than visual pictures, pixels, it's uh, uh, heat pixels. So we're seeing, like, for example, this is another example of a vertical wall that wasn't insulated, so that's why it shows up as purple. Or this example here, this wall looks like, you know, pretty standard, <coughs> but one bay in this is poorly insulated and the other bay is better insulated. Um, so very handy for, for things like that to, to help find kind of areas of missing insulation, things like that. And then, like I mentioned, uh, oftentimes, a good energy auditor will do combustion safety tests as well as combustion efficiency tests. And so they're gonna be looking to make sure there aren't any carbon monoxide problems in a home. Um, this is an old style gas hot water heater and a lot of the older ones just basically have this opening right here, which you might think, well, geez, that's the flue pipe. You know, why is there an opening? It's actually by design to bring in what we call dilution air into the flue gases. But if you had uh, a, you know, commercial uh, kitchen vent hood and you turn that on and now you're kind of sucking so much air through that vent hood you could be sucking the flue gases into the house. So those are the kind of things that a good energy auditor is going to test for. And then just in terms of heating systems we're not going to go into a lot of detail because there's so many different types but just you know having them tested efficiency tested and cleaned. If you've got furnace filters you should be replacing them several times over the heating season. Uh, and if you have duct work, they should be sealed and insulated. Um, and then I've got a few more slides about some of the, uh, the different types of heating systems that are out there and some of the incentives that are available. But one thing to think about, people kind of oftentimes kind of focus on their heating equipment first 
and they're kind of like, well, you know, first what I'm going to do is get a more efficient heating equipment, and then maybe I'll think about insulation, and maybe I'll think about air sealing. Um, the problem is that's sort of like having a nice, you know, efficient pump for a leaky bucket. It's like it's still a leaky bucket no matter how efficient the pump is. And so think about that envelope as the area that you really want to focus on first. And if you had a really good envelope, you don't hardly even need much of the heating system. You know, no matter, uh, uh, you know, obviously it would be better if it was an efficient one, but uh, you, can, you can get by with a relatively inefficient heating system in a very efficient building envelope much more than the other way around. So this is an example of uh, air leakage, uh, kind of a crazy example where the, uh, the energy auditor was downstairs running the blower door and then heard this like crash and was wondering what was going on upstairs. And this was kind of like a house that got flipped and they had an old medicine cabinet that they took out and rather than actually seal this all off, they just put a mirror in front of it. And so the blower door, because of all that massive air movement that was going from the blower door, all that air leakage, it actually blew the, the mirror off, the, uh, off its uh, nail. So, you know, interesting what you can find uh, with doing a little snooping around like that. But not very obvious without a blower door running. All right, so some of the New Hampshire saves programs, we already talked about appliance rebates. I'll talk a little bit about heating, <coughs> cooling, hot water heating incentives, and then Energy Star New Homes, it's some nice program there, uh, and home energy assistance. And then the, the big one is this home performance one um, because it kind of relates to a lot of things that I've just been talking about. And there's some nice incentives with it as well. So in terms of efficient heating, cooling, and hot water, it's so somewhat a busy slide. I just uh, updated it because there's incentives that are available not only from New Hampshire SAIS with utilities, but also through the Inflation Reduction Act. And so you'll see New Hampshire SAVES or IRA for the Inflation Reduction Act. For example, if you were to buy an efficient rated new stove, you can get a 30% tax credit up to $2,000, including the installation costs of certain new uh, wood stoves. And then if you're with uh, Liberty Utilities for natural gas, there's some nice incentives for efficient natural gas boilers and furnaces. And then the heat pumps, both heat pump for heating as well as heat pumps for, for domestic hot water, there's incentives from New Hampshire Saves as well as incentives from the Inflation Reduction Act. And I've got a few more slides right at the end about some of the programs that are coming down the pike that are being administered or going to be administered by New Hampshire Department of Energy that are Inflation Reduction Act programs. Yeah. What does mini-split mean? Yeah, mini-split is, uh, and I've got a slide, oh, maybe I'll, yep, yeah, that's the next one. So a mini-split basically means it's split between inside and outside. You know, this is kind of the workhorse unit outside, uh, and then the, the inside, the head is, and so it's not a ducted system because it's just basically air from the room is kind of going into that head and getting heated or cooled. Um, but you can have heat pumps that are ducted, and we're not quite there yet, or we're almost there, but we're getting almost to the point where we can have heat pumps that re can replace boilers, called what are called air-to-water heat pumps, where, you know, if it was a well-insulated, well-air-sealed house, there are some, uh, I think LG has a model now that, that could do the trick. But the problem is, is that heat pumps are, the, the heat they generate is relatively low temperature, and the heat that's generated by boilers is relatively high temperature, typically, like 170 degrees versus 130 degrees. And so we're, that gap is getting narrower, but we're not quite there with some of the mainstream uh, heat pump manufacturers, but we're getting close. And then there's kind of this misconception that these heat pumps um, don't work when it gets really cold. A lot of them are still producing a reasonable amount of heat at negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And at five degrees, they're just, you know, humming along. And so, you know, how many times did we have negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit last year in Concord? It's like we had one day where it got down to minus 15, but we had very few days below zero. And heat pumps, for the most part, you know, worked just fine in those conditions. So we're, we're at the point now where heat pumps can be your primary heating source, as well as provide cooling in the summertime. But, uh... Once again, 
I know people that have brand new heat pumps that had to go live elsewhere last winter because of the particular model they had. Yep, they've got to get the right model. So you say it's the primary heat source. It needs to be a cold climate model because there certainly are models that don't work very well, you know, below 10 degrees or something like that. So it needs to be one that is shown that it's going to work in this sort of climate. Um, but that's a, that's a very good point. Or if it's something like 20 years old, the technology has just gotten a lot better in, in recent years. And there is a site, there's the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, where you can look up model by model and what its rating is at different temperatures. And so that can be very handy to see. Is this particular model going to meet my needs, you know, here in Concord, New Hampshire? When you call it primary heat source, and the one woman who was back had a wood stove installed, even though it's a lot of valuable space, is very pleased. Yeah, yeah. So it is because they don't produce as much heat, the colder it gets, and it could be, you know, kind of does pretty well and then kind of drops off at a certain point, it is very helpful having another heat source and like a wood stove and a heat pump, in my opinion, is a, a great, great combination. Um, and so in terms of how they work, it's really just like a refrigerator or air conditioner. They're all kind of working on the same refrigeration cycle. It's not generating heat, it's moving heat from one place to another and does the opposite in the summertime. It's basically moving heat from outside the house and, and pushing it outside. So the weird part of a heat pump is that it's able to extract heat out of zero degree air and concentrate that through the refrigeration cycle and move it inside. Um, but you know, the technology just keeps on getting better and better in that regard. <coughs> and in terms of incentives that are available for, for heating and, and hot water and whatnot, it's actually not a huge amount of incentive from New Hampshire Saves, about $250 per ton, which is 12,000 BTUs. You know, you may only need like a four ton system or something like that. Um, there are some bigger incentives for natural, efficient natural gas boilers and furnaces. There's a nice incentive, $750 for heat pump hot water heaters. And if you're buying a heat pump system, you can get an incentive for smart thermostats as well. Definitely worth going to the NewHampshireSaves.com website to, uh, um, to see what the specific incentives are. And then there is this, uh, uh, net zero competition with builders for new construction as well as New Hampshire Saves Energy Star certified new homes. Not going to talk about that a whole lot, but um, those are both great programs. The program that I do want to talk about a bit more is that New Hampshire Saves Home Performance Program because it's a 75% incentive that you can get up to a contribution of $6,000 from the utilities. and um, the energy audit costs $100 up front, but actually that $100 becomes a credit towards any work that's done. So essentially it's a zero cost to you uh, energy audit. And the 75% you know, uh, cost share is pretty, pretty dang good. And you can potentially, if the house is you know, in quite bad shape, you can kind of go through and get things done one year and then come back to the program and see if you qualify uh, for a second year. And Ted is, is pretty uh, experienced with, with this program, so if you have any questions after the end of the show, he's a good person to, to ask. Andy, could I, did I hear Eversource talking about a, talking about an on-bill financing that they offer? They can, yeah. And um, that's what's kind of nice is that uh, for the part that you do have to pay, or sometimes they'll say, all right, if you get a heat pump or efficient, heating system at the same time, you can finance that. And it, it's oftentimes either 0% or very low percentage financing. And I'm not sure if it's the same with all the utilities, but I think some of them offer what's called the on-bill financing, where it's just another line item on your, on your electric bill. And typically, if it is financing like that, um, not in every case, but oftentimes, you're saving so much energy that even though you might be financing it, your net monthly cost might be less than it was before. So yeah, definitely worth going to NewHampshireSaves.com to find out about this program. And I've got a couple more slides about how you qualify for it. It's essentially this uh, home heating index is how you qualify. So you need to know um, how much of heating fuels you've used over the past 12 months, the condition square footage of your home, here in Concord, you can actually look that up online through the city assessor's uh, database. And um, 
basically who, you, who your utility is and your zip code. It gets a little bit more complicated if you use, uh, if you have electric heat, because then you have to, and it doesn't show up here because I just clicked on no, but if you click on yes, it has a little screen that comes up and you have to enter your electric bill for all 12 months, uh, the monthly electric bill. So a little bit more than these, these other ones, it's just kind of um, what would be the uh, annual amount that's being used. And you can put in kind of rough numbers. They're going to need to verify all this. It's, it's, uh, they even do things like if you heat with wood, they'll be like, can you take a photograph of your wood pile? You know, things like that. Uh, but uh, once you get that all in, this is example for Laconia, 2,000 square foot house, 800 gallons of heating oil and two full cords of wood. So with that information, you get this home heating index score. Uh, and in this case, the house score is at a 9.04, which is fairly high. Basically, the higher the score, the worse your house is in terms of how much heating fuel you use per square foot. Excuse me. But the higher the score, the more likely you are to qualify for this home performance program. So this is the confusing part. Uh, if you got that, if you were this house, you would qualify if you're with Eversource or with New Hampshire Electric Co-op because the score is higher than, than seven or eight. But unfortunately with Unitil, you wouldn't qualify. And the same thing with uh, Liberty Natural Gas, you wouldn't qualify. So it kind of, these numbers can vary. You know, these numbers change just this year. So I would say if you don't qualify, you know, go through the exercise. If you don't qualify this year, come back in six months or so and, and do the exercise again with this online home heating index calculator and, and see if you do qualify. There are, they did have a, a program, I think they're kind of phasing it out, maybe they might have it for the remainder of 2023. For homes that don't qualify, they have what's called a visual audit program, which was kind of neat because if you want a Nest thermostat, they would give you one for free as part of that program and some other kind of freebies, but not sure if that's going to be continuing in 2024. And this might be a little hard to, to, to read, but this is an example of uh, the work that was done in a home through home performance. And essentially, they got over $10,000 of work done. They only had to pay a little over $4,000. And um, this was a couple of years ago, and I think that the payback would be even better than that 7.5 years that, that's on there. So um, pretty nice. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, people can save 20, 30 percent of their home's energy use, particularly the, the heating energy use through going through this program. So like I mentioned before, there's also the weatherization assistance program. And so this is the income qualified program that's run through the community action agencies. And there's New Hampshire electric and fuel assistance programs as well to help with fuel bills. And so uh, <coughs> helpful to know about. I know we're a little after 830, but I have three slides about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, do y'all want to see those or are you kind of? OK. So yeah, it's a little complicated. It's a big, sprawling uh, law. And it has a lot of different components that are relevant for residential energy. And so the one, there's, there's three slides. This first one, this is all uh, available today. And that's essentially tax credits. And so if you get something installed in 2023 and it qualifies, say like a heat pump, hot water heater, you can get a 30% tax credit up to these limits. Um, so up to $2,000 or a heat pump uh, heater. And that's on top of the New Hampshire saves incentives. So that's kind of nice. You would take it, you would fill out the tax credit form on your 2023 taxes next year. Um, so it's not, you know, immediate sort of thing. But a tax credit, much better than a tax deduction, it basically lowers the amount that you have to pay for taxes by, by these amounts. And then it gets a little more complicated, so there's, um, this home electrification appliance rebate program, and then there's this other home energy rebate program, and that's an either or. So you can do one of these two programs, home electrification <coughs> appliance, the HERE program, or the home efficiency rebates, but you can't do both of them. And anything that you do under this program would be on top of 
the tax credits and on top of any New Hampshire saves incentives. So potentially you could get three different incentives for the same thing, like a heat pump hot water heater that you could, um, you could get up to $1,750 through the HERE program. You could get up to $2,000 through um, the tax credit program and you could get a $750 rebate through New Hampshire saves. So it's kind of nice that you know, the, these are stackable. Um, this program is income qualified. It's up to 150% of adjusted mean income, which like for a family of four around here, 150% of adjusted mean income is around $190,000, I think. So it, it goes up uh, fairly high. And then if, if a household is under 80% of that adjusted mean income, it's a 100% rebate rather than a 50% rebate. These programs have not, these, the number two and number three have not been implemented yet. They're just kind of in the process. The U.S. <coughs> Department of Energy has kind of put out guidance and says here's how states should be implementing them. There is, there is a website on the New Hampshire Department of Energy uh, or web page on their website that kind of is kind of like watch this space. Here's, you know, here's what we know. And I think the latest that I've heard from New Hampshire Department of Energy is that they are planning on kind of going through the process where they'd be implementing these programs somewhere in the later part of 2024. So hopefully by this time next year, uh, these programs would already be being uh, implemented. This one's kind of more focused on electrification of homes, but it does have like a weatherization component. And this one is kind of closer to that home performance program with New Hampshire Saves. Um, and it's more associated with what sort of savings can you get from kind of a package of improvements that could include a lot of different things. And again, it's got an income aspect to it, but this one does not have a 150% um, adjusted mean income max. It's basically under 80% and then everybody else. So and there's a lot of stuff there. Um, this information is on that, uh, uh, the PDF of the presentation through the Plymouth uh, Renewable Energy Initiative. So don't feel like you have to kind of take it all down here. And there's some good like calculators and things like that that you can use as well to see what might be relevant for your specific uh, situation. Okay, well, a lot of stuff. I know it's kind of a lot to digest. Um, we still got a little bit of time before eight o'clock, but I'm pretty much done. And thanks for sticking with me. And um, this is the information about where you can find the button up presentation. And certainly if you want to get a hold of me, I both work through Lakes Region Community College running their energy training program, but I also do other work as well. Um, and so I'm always interested in hearing what people's challenges or you know, issues are or, or recommendations or whatever. But also Ted is available to talk with folks if you're interested, particularly in that home performance uh, program. Well, thank you. Thank you. In this program, if you were considering uh, weatherizing your home now, would you wait for this? To yeah, you wouldn't want to do it now if you want to take advantage of this program. Because you know, they haven't said definitively, but it's sounding like you won't be able to qual you know, get any rebates until they're actually starting to implement the program. You can't say, I've already done this, can I get a rebate? It's probably not going to work uh, along those lines. But the tax incentives are there for sure. But the tax credits you can take advantage of now. Right. So, so uh, you get into your savings, you could get a six thousand dollar rebate for your insulation and air sealing. Plus, you can get the tax credit. So, I guess it's sort of a: is it worth waiting and spending another winter's worth or two worth of fuel? Yeah. <laughs> for, for this down the road, it's I'd say you know if you're thinking about like a heat pump uh, or heat pump hot water. I, w I would definitely encourage you to, to wait because these, you know, on top of the tax credits, both of these programs have heat pump incentives and a pretty, pretty nice one here with the, the HERE program and the heat pump can be part of that 20 to 35 or over 35% savings. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Credit 
or having the energy on? Oh, with the New Hampshire Saves home yeah. performance? Is that like conditional? Um, is it the, if you know you're going to spend $100 on something, then can you just get, the, get, get it for free then? I mean... You have to work with a contractor that has been like approved by the utilities, so you can't just kind of do it out on your own. So it has to be through that home heating, getting the home heating index mm -hmm. and making sure you qualify that way. They're going to ask for um, verification of your, your fuel bills and things like that. And then they can either assign you a contract or you can work with a contractor of your own choosing, but it's within their kind of list of qualified contractors. Who, so if you're paying a contractor, is it going to be more than $100? And you're just no, you'd only be paying the $100 up front. And then any work that gets done, that basically that $100 gets credited towards your copay, towards any work that's done. So that's where it becomes okay. essentially so zero cost to you. Anything. You have to pay $100 up front, but then it becomes a credit. Right. Yeah. But then you get that back. And, yep. you, and whatever you do, it's like the first $100 you spend, not conditional upon spending a certain amount of money. Yeah. Get yeah. It's, you know, they just don't want people who are just kind of like tire kickers and want their free audit and aren't going to do anything. So they want people, they want people that actually yeah. make some energy efficiency improvements. All you have to do is want to spend $100 and you can get that for free. Yeah, I mean, it might be, you know, the recommendations might be bigger than $100, the, the measure or something like that. But, uh, yeah, but that, that's a good question. Yeah. If you install a heat pump water heater in your basement, mm -hmm. does the temperature of the basement go down? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question I hadn't, didn't talk about. They, you know, they're sort of like a heat pump heater. They're taking heat from the ambient conditions and concentrating it through the refrigeration cycle to heat the hot water. So it's great in the summertime because they actually will de dehumidify the basement as well. In the wintertime, all these heat pump hot water heaters have a kind of like winter option where you can just use resistive electric heat. So if you find that your basement's getting too cold, you can switch over to that. Some of them will kind of do an automatic switch over according to the you know temperature that it senses um, but yes that is that it can be an issue um, but you know if you insulate your basement well and things like that it's i've, I've the the people that i know who have heat pump hot water heaters that their experience has been it wasn't as big an issue as they thought it was going to be but you know every every house is a little different Do they need to be no no i mean you can bring in air from outside to provide that, that heat. But for the most part, they're going to be much more efficient with that 50 degree, 60 degree air in the basement than that really cold air outside. But yeah, I, you know, they're, they're, um, they're not as widely, they're not as popular as I think they should be because I think they work quite well. And they <coughs> really reduce uh, uh, electrical consumption if you're going from a, standard electric heater to, to one of those. Maybe I'm not sure, I can't remember if you mentioned or not, but one thing about the New Hampshire Saves program that people should know too is that it doesn't matter whether you own your house or you rent, you can still get, you can still get a rebate for installation work in your house. Obviously, if you rent, you have to work with your landlord because your landlord would not be doing this work, you know, without their knowledge. But uh, we've done lots of projects in, people, in people's houses that, you know, rental, rental properties, you just have to coordinate with the landlord. And the other interesting thing is that it's, uh, it's not done on the address of the house, it's done on the electric meter. So, like we, for instance, we did a, a home in Newmarket about two or three years ago, and uh, the, the homeowner had split it up into four different apartments and put four different electric meters in there because he had four different apartments, four different tenants in there. And he got four rebates from Ember Source to do the house. We didn't even use the third or the fourth one, we only used three of them. So, he got $18,000 about from Ember Source, and he only had to spend you know, three or four. And, and we ended up insulating the attic, the walls, the basement, the whole bit. Um, and so same with like... Uh, like that, if there's two electric meters, you could potentially get two rebates for that. For and that. same with like condo associations and yeah. utilities love to work with apartment complex owners because that, you know, is more, more opportunities for them. But you'd have to convince the, the owner, you know, to go through the program. And the they do thing, have slightly different programs for multifamily. But the other really cool thing is that uh, if you have natural gas and... Um, a different electric company, which could be the same person. It could be Unitil Gas, Unitil 
electric, uh, you could potentially get two different rebates from the utility. I have a couple customers right now who are sitting on proposals where they're going to get $12,000, six from Unitil gas, six from Unitil electric, and they only have to pay two, two and a half or something for their project. So the whole project is like $14,000, but they're only paying two because wow. they actually pay two rebates. Wow, yeah, that's great. So if you work out, if you have two different, um, if, if your natural gas company is different than your electric company, uh, again, it could, be, it could both be Unitil, but Unitil gas and Unitil electric. Right? Yeah, so, so here is like Liberty, Liberty Gas and Unitil Electric. Yeah, or yeah. Source Electric and Unitil Gas, like in Portsmouth or something, that, that works pretty well too, so. Well, great. Well, uh, I know we're getting, getting on there, and the library's going to close in about 12 minutes or something like that. So I'll stick around, you know, if you've got any other questions, but thank you very much.